After shoes, there is no more important piece of equipment than your belt, and no other company provides the service, quality, and prices that Dominion gives you. Whether you're looking for a three or four inch lever or prong, straps, or their newest offering, an all leather dip belt, this is the place to get the highest quality fast. Don't wait months to get your belt. They have your belt in stock now, ready to help you crush more PRs. And you're supporting a small American business when you order. Go to dominionstrengthtraining.com and use code LOGIC to get 10% off. That's dominionstrengthtraining.com to get your new belt. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome, everybody, to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Nikki Sims here with our favorite Matt Reynolds. And today we are welcoming and introducing Josh Veach, who is our CIO, Chief Information Officer. And we're going to talk to him about marketing and what his background entails and what he does for us and what he does for his nonprofit. But before we get into that, I think you should know how Josh and Matt came to know each other because it's not (laughs) the usual story of lifting and someone came up to Matt in the gym and was like, how do I get to be so jacked as you? (laughs) It's a very unique story for someone who works for us. So how did you guys meet? Hey, Josh, here's what I think we should do. I'm going to go three, two, one. We're going to say (laughs) one word. We have not rehearsed this. That would be, how did we come to know each other? Right? Like, what is the thing that made us? Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Huge tornadoes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I hyphenated huge neighbor, but that's two words. Uh, yeah, I hyphenated it to make it work. That's a whole nother meaning when it's yeah. hyphenated. So yeah, what's the background there? <laughs> yeah, so Matt and I were neighbors in Springfield, in North Springfield. We both moved since then. But yeah, we were neighbors across the street. And so our house was on the high side. We were a ranch house and Matt's family lived on the low side of the street. And so they had a basement. And my wife is terrified of tornadoes, especially then when we didn't have a basement. Fair enough. And we're talking, you know, if you're familiar with where Springfield, Missouri is, we're not very far from where Joplin is. And the reason you've likely heard of Joplin, Missouri is because of the massive tornado that went through there. In fact, when that tornado went through, Matt and I both had debris in our yard from that tornado, (gasps) even though we're an hour away. It was crazy. Oh my gosh. Yes. 60 miles away. Wow. So it's a valid fear. (laughs) Tornado alley, for sure. We got to know Matt and Rachel a little bit. And then, uh, There were a couple of times where we were right at that tornado warning where it's like, "Mm, this is maybe close. And so my wife is like, we need to go next door. So we would (laughs) go over and hang out for a few minutes until the storm went by. Matt, would you have like tornado parties in the basement? (laughs) No, Everyone would be down there and be like, I'm making everybody cocktails. (laughs) It's weird. It seems like tornadoes hit a lot of times here, like in the mid to late evening. So somewhere between like 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. I don't know why that is. And maybe I'm just pulling that out of nowhere. Well, because things are more dramatic when it's dark. Well, but it doesn't. Yes, that's true. And I think there were a couple like middle of the night ones that, you know, they hit it like two in the morning and the, door, the doorbell rings and we were already awake. You know, we exchanged numbers. I'd call them or text them and be like, if you guys are freaking out, you can come over. It's fine. Oh, I don't think we ever went over it that late. I mean, <laughs> I feel like it was all sort of mid evening. Yeah. If I could get Rochelle to fall asleep, then we were going to be okay. We're going to ride it out. But that <laughs> yeah. sounds terrible. I didn't mean it to sound terrible. It was just like that. It's less fear when you're like, if you're sleeping through it. So yeah. 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 <laughs> At the time, like I like playing poker. I had a poker table down in my basement. Josh came over. He's like, can you play poker? You got a card table down here. Like, I like playing poker. And so I was like, oh, yeah, I get guys from my church. And yeah, obviously, I mean, what better thing for guys to that go to church together than gamble together? Like, that <laughs> right. seems like they go hand in hand. For what Religion it's worth, and what we would do is we would. <laughs> it's a big leap of faith. <laughs> we would play a $5 or a $10 tournament is what we would do. So everybody pitched in $10. So it was like a cheap night of entertainment is what it would be. And Josh would come over and we'd hang out and do that. The interesting thing was, I think the very first time we had a business interaction is we had just moved into or were in the process of moving into the big new strong gym that we had a uh, building we had purchased downtown. And we were needing a website. We had a really good following at the time on Facebook. And that was mostly because we were lucky that it was sort of we got in early, we were kind of the first, you know, kind of big strength gym on Facebook and in the area. And so it kind of blew up. But we knew we needed a good website. And somehow I think Josh, you said, man, I'd like to pitch the idea of building this website out for you. 
I remember very clearly that you showed, I mean, here's like this guy who's my neighbor and played cards with and, you know, sat around and, and had tea at night while the tornadoes went by. <laughs> and uh, he came in with super professional and put out this really, really nice proposal for our oh, website. Wow. And we were still very small potatoes at the time as a gym. I mean, the gym was big and looked like we were bigger than we were. You know, we were barely paying the bills at the time. And so really kind of the rest is history there. Josh just did the website for Strong and it was great and continued to do all that work. Didn't work for Strong, just what you ran kind of a web development and marketing firm. Is that fair? What for? Yeah. So at that season, I was kind of just getting into doing that work. So my background is in marketing. I've spent time in a couple of agencies. I've done corporate in-house marketing. And at the time I was working in a marketing department, but it was just kind of it was a tough environment. And I thought, man, I was at the time was on a couple nonprofit boards and both had great things going on inside, but they like, it didn't represent outside. Like they didn't have a website or social media presence that reflected the cool stuff going on on the inside. And so I kind of made it my mission to figure out how do we get these organizations online and bring them up to speed. And so that was what kind of got me into web development. That was right around the time. At that point, I had done a couple projects just pro bono and never really intended to necessarily start a business out of it. But then I had a few other people come to me. And so it was like, can't give away my time like this. And that turned into a business. And that's what at that time with Matt was just kind of getting started and was like, okay, like I know he's starting a business. I know they're just getting started and they probably don't have a website yet. So this is an opportunity. So that's what happened. So you saw that they were doing really great things on the inside, but it wasn't getting shared on the outside. A lot of our listeners are lifters and wanting to be coaches. And so they might do this work on their own. So they know what's going on on the inside. We have an understanding of it. We know what we're trying to convey. But having not been a lifter at that point, you weren't a strong man or anything. Like, how did you find out what they were trying to sell and attract new clients with? What kind of questions do you ask? Yeah. So I think it starts with really understanding who your audience is and what matters to them. Too oftentimes, businesses, nonprofits, whatever, they want to push their story out. Typically the about page is about us. Like they build their whole messaging around about us. So too often we make the message about us as the business or the nonprofit or whatever. But on the other side, we are not most important to the listener. The listener is most important to the listener. The receiver of the message is the one that's most important in their own life. And so being able to recognize what's the value that they're after, what is driving their decision-making, and then put your messaging out that's consistent with that. And so it's really about, you know, for Matt's situation, it's how do we share that this gym is different than the CrossFit gym over here or whatever, and then, you know, create the opportunity for people to easily sign up and get started and get their questions answered and all that good stuff. So what I heard from that was know your audience by knowing what's important to them. Identify what makes you different than other businesses that might offer similar products and then make it easy for them to pay you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to learn about you, right? Mm hmm. Yep. Okay. But I think you also have to be authentic. You can't sell yourself for something that you're not because people are going to see right through that. Yeah. You can for a short period of time. Yeah. But it's unsustainable. High churn. <laughs> right. It also then creates negative word of mouth. That's exactly right. Word of mouth is your most effective opportunity for marketing and sales. And the moment you start selling yourself for something you're not, that becomes your reputation. Yep. Nikki, do you remember a few months ago, I think it was Utah when we were in Salt Lake and we had a client, somebody, he was trying to explain what's different about Barbell Logic to everyone else during the Q&A. People were asking questions. Mm -hmm. He had the best answer of anybody and he wasn't on staff. He said something along the lines of, other companies try to make the client fit the program, try to fit their mold. Right. Yes. At Barbell Logic, you are the program. You are the service. You are the mold. Like it's about you. And Barbell Logic figures out how to serve you. And that's been this, I get choked up now thinking about it. Like that's what we've tried to do, not perfectly over the last several years, but you can see us moving that direction that it's not about Matt Reynolds. It's not about Nikki Sims. It's not about a cult of personality. Right. It's not about here's this thing that we're going to force you a square peg into a round hole. It's that everyone is different. Everyone is valuable. Everyone has got this like intrinsic value in their humanity and has needs. For us, we start with meeting a lot of times those physical needs and we recognize that that feeds down to those other, starts to feed into the emotional, social, mental piece. And so 
I think Josh has done a tremendous job and the whole team has done a tremendous job of trying to get that out. I've even noticed people who in the past have been sort of negative towards us on social media, recognizing the change in our culture and recognize it in a positive way. And I think that's kind of cool when you see people who at one time talked maybe poorly about us years ago and now say like they recognize that we're doing something different that we're actually trying to meet the client where they are. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way Josh has helped get that out to the world. When you have a coach who's maybe designing their own website or designing an Instagram and Facebook presence, do you have any big no-nos? Oh, that's a great question. So you're weighing different pieces of communication, right? You're weighing like language, like how do you speak about what you do and who you are and kind of defining some consistency around that. Like to what Matt was saying, you got to pick like, what are the selling points or really the opportunities like of how you're going to help them develop. And you're reinforcing that in every post. It might say it slightly differently, but you're slowly through repetition building like the positioning in their mind that when they think of you as a coach or when they think of you as a business, this is what comes to mind. I actually saw a great graphic on this exact topic talking about different beers. And so like it was an example was if I tell you a beer that you're going to drink while you're relaxing, what beer comes to mind? Corona. So good. Corona, right? You're miles <laughs> yeah. from ordinary. Isn't that wild? And I think if I tell you about a beer that's like ice cold, what do you think of? Tapping the Rockies. What beer is that? Yeah, Coors. <laughs> yeah. From Coors, the exactly. Cold Mountain Streams mm-hmm. of the Rockies. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh my God. They totally got us. Oh, wow. I didn't have to tell you. I didn't have to tell you anything. <laughs> no. But over time, they have staked their claim on we're not just a beer for all these people. We are the coldest beer. Like we're cold brewed. Yes. This so is good. the coldest beer. Or we're the beer that you drink when you are wanting to get away and you just want to take a breather. That didn't just happen overnight. That was a strategic decision that they made. And then over time, that is the positioning in your mind. And so for coaches, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, this is what I'm doing. And you kind of map that out and keep reinforcing that message. Yeah. And then the other piece of that is visually is find a visual style that fits for you and be consistent with that. You don't have to have, you know, a professional designer make things for you. But if you're making graphics, you're making text to images or things like that, pick a color scheme, stick with that color scheme, use it consistently, pick a font family, use it consistently. And you are without a lot of effort, you're building your visual brand just by creating some parameters and sticking with it. And that's cool. Yeah, it's weird. I was going to say, so if you ever go to like ratebeer.com and you look at Corona, it's got terrible ratings. And yet (laughs) I drink Corona. Now, is this before 2020 (laughs) or is it? Yeah, this is before 2020. Actually, I haven't looked at it in probably 10 years, but I remember checking it, looking it out. Looking it up one time when I was looking for Mexican beer, I was like, oh, Negra Modelo is the good one. Right. But <laughs> the thing is that I like to go to Mexico. When I go to Mexico, I drink Corona because it's all over the place and they put the little lime wedge in. So and it fits the commercial even today, even it's, today, it's the commercial <laughs> when I put a lime wedge in a bottle of Corona, I am immediately taken back to the beaches of Mexico. And that is got to be this subliminal thing that I have seen a hundred times. Hundred percent, right? And you hear the seagulls in the background, yeah. and you see the bare feet on the beach. <laughs> yes, and there's the Corona. It's incredible. It works every single time. Yeah. No talking. <laughs> no yes. talking. You know, that's right. You know, that's the best part. <laughs> and it, so the other thing I heard you say there, and it's really a combination of both the way you say things or the way you communicate verbally or written typed, and the way you see things visually. That I learned from our previous VP of marketing, who was fantastic. She used to say one consistent voice. Yes. She said it all the time. Now, one consistent voice is actually not that hard when you're the only person doing the thing, right? And I think in early sort of figuring out who you are and what you're doing and you don't have hardly any following, you've got a little bit of flexibility there to kind of find that niche. Like, what is my niche? What is my voice? What is the message I'm trying to communicate? That becomes a lot harder and it has for us as we have grown. And now, you know, Matt Reynolds does not run the social media accounts for Barbell Logic. Or like we have people that do like social media, we have people that do the graphic design, we have people that do the marketing, we have, but one consistent voice is still really, really important. And now the voice of Barbell Logic is Barbell Logics. It's not Matt's or Nikki's or somebody else's. And so I think that carries through whether you are a one man show or one woman show or a party of 80, that's huge in marketing. And so that when you see the seagulls and the bare feet, And the bottle of Corona with the, got it, took me right back to where I'm supposed to be. Right. 
And what's tough about that or the challenge that comes with that is as you grow, you offer more things, Yeah. right? So now we have nutrition has become a much more important element of what we do because as you guys talked about in the block party presentation, the total picture is what we're trying to offer. Yeah. And then the academy piece, which allows people to grow in education. So it becomes more and more challenging. And you would think that as your team grows, as resources grow, it becomes easier. But really, as you grow, the opportunities to stray from that voice become easier because you're offering different things. Yeah. And so you have to get, and I think that's an area where we're still redefining some of those things, like keeping that voice consistent so that it resonates for our strength coaching, for our nutrition coaching, and for our educational opportunities through the academy. Yeah. Because you don't want to add more services and then make your message more broad in general, right? You still need right. to have kind of your specific target audience and product market fit, right? Right. right. Yeah, and, and when you're focusing on service, you know, it's important that as you grow, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger to the individual client, to the end user, you continue to feel small and personal. And that's hard, right? So when you're a coach with eight clients, it's really easy to feel small and personal. When you're 60 coaches with 1,200 clients, how do you still feel small and personal? Well, it's because you're still developing the relationship at the client coach level. And you're right, like I, I had a, so we're getting ready to go to Scotland and England. I sent out 257 emails to our clients, me personally, sent out not, not batch, enter, template, send 257 out. I sent 257 individual emails out on Sunday. And I got at least 12 or 13 back, not Reynolds exaggeration, that were like, hey, thanks for the template email. This is actually an honor, but I'm sure it's not actually Matt Reynolds. They all said something like that. And immediately I said, in fact, it is me. I sent this one out. I'm super excited that you might come to this camp. And oh, by the way, I sent 256 others. <laughs> and they were like, never cease to amaze me, Matt Reynolds. I'm like, You're gosh dang right. <laughs> Personal, baby. So anyway, I don't know. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to do. By the way, I never want to do that again. <laughs> it is hard to do because you want to talk to a direct yeah, no, person. Be a machine. Yeah, you don't want to it's just horrible. yell. You never want to do that again. <laughs> but I think the most important piece of that, though, is that you have the personal element, but at the end of the day, you have to deliver on the brand promise. What yeah. have you told those people that you're going to deliver? So in our case, that personal relationship is so valuable at the client and coach level. And we want to try to make it as personable as possible in all areas. But at the end of the day, as long as that coach and the service is meeting the expectations that we set at the very beginning when they signed up, if we're meeting or exceeding that, that's what builds that trust yeah. and that credibility. It's like, you know, you can do things over the top. Nikki's doing a great job at helping us find those extras that like make it the experience even greater. But our goal is that we set this expectation. This is what you get when you sign up. Your first month is free and you pay this amount every month. And this is what you get. These are the bullets. This is our promise of the service. And as long as you're checking off those boxes, then they're feeling heard. They're getting yeah. what they paid for. And that is what allows us to have you know a low churn is that in any business, as long as you're providing what you say you're going to provide, it's the greatest way to maintain those relationships. It's really reinforcing that you have to be sure about who you are. And then the people on your sales team have to sell exactly what you are. And then the images that people are seeing have to be completely reflective. And then the team has to be all on the same page. Yeah. And I think for people who are newer coaches, and I've struggled with this too, when I was doing my own coaching, it's just like, well, I feel like I need to be everything for everyone. And so you'll spend a couple of weeks talking about this, you'll spend a couple weeks talking about competition and then you'll jump around and talk about something else. And so you'll get all these clients that want everything and you can't be all of those things. So it's nice to know that it's okay to just kind of filter in and be exactly who you are and then just repetitively reinforce that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't want to have a culture of scarcity there. Right. And certainly we haven't for us, I think it's one of our big value propositions is that we have a coach that can probably meet your needs specific to your niche for your goals that can serve you and serve you well. And that's much harder to do when you are a single coach who's just trying to make a living. And we've said this before. There are those times when you're trying to build that you're trying to just make a living. You are you're just trying to you know make the mortgage payment and pay the insurance that you kind of do have to take anybody you can get. But pretty quickly, 
you're going to start to see who really thrives under you. And you don't have to be everything to everybody. So even if you are, again, a one man, one woman show, within a year or so of coaching or doing this at a pretty high clip rate, you can start to hone in on exactly who you coach. And then you can own that little niche. The world is massive. There's 8 billion people, right? And especially if you're in the online coaching world, there are, I mean, what, three quarters of those people have access to smartphones. I realize there's a smaller percentage that can afford it, but there's just, I don't understand like why we're trying to compete against brother and sister companies or even somebody like, let's say you hone in on postnatal females and there's 20 other women that do that. Do we need to get mad at those? Like, <laughs> holy cow, how many people are having babies every year? <laughs> like, There's, so there's lots of people out there, right? So it's okay to actually find that niche. And here's what's interesting. We often talk about, this is really one of the things that Nikki does so well at Barbell Logic is we want to be able to make sure that the client feels great about what they're doing at Barbell Logic, but we also want to make sure that the coach feels great about what they're doing at Barbell Logic, right? And so when you're coaching the people that you love and you coach the demographic that you love, you also feel more fulfilled and therefore you're better at your job. We've all had the client that you're like, you yeah, know, I can think of the ones like at Strong when I coached in person and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. at 9 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. By the way, if you are actually were the 9 a.m. at Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would just it's not pick right a time. number out of dinner. <laughs> So, but you're like, you know, those sessions that feel like an hour and a half bad date yeah. that you have to schedule for the next week also forever. <laughs> like, oh. You got to do it three times a week for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they're rough. So you said some really great things there, Matt. And it reminded me that when you're trying to identify what your niche might be, sometimes we forget that it's okay if it's the one that feels the easiest. Yeah. Because you don't realize that that's special. You like you don't think like, oh, that can't be anything special because I just do it. And then you spend energy kind of forcing stuff because yeah. you think you should be getting good at those other things. Yep. I remember I'm a little bit of I probably said this on the podcast before. I'm a little bit of like a closeted CrossFit Games fan. I kind of like they're just they're just <laughs> they're such amazing freaky athletes. athletes. They're amazing that's to incredible. watch. Right? Yeah. And I was always interested, especially over the last five or six years to watch some of these athletes, like you take one that was really, really strong, like crazy strong. And they were like, I'm so strong, I need to really, really focus on my conditioning and focus on the thing I'm bad at. And they come back the next year and they place 10 places lower, right? When you're in the lead, you gotta push your chips to the middle of the table. Like you gotta let your gains fly. Like that's the thing, right? Does that mean we don't ever work on the things that we suck at? Like, look, we've had lots of conversations, especially I can still do it, but you know, Nikki Sims at experience and Andrew Jackson at operations, Matt Reynolds is a real good salesperson who can, if not very careful, can overpromise and under deliver. And they were like, Hey, we got to make sure that what you're saying everywhere else we can deliver on. Right. And Josh was laughing. I can see him like he's smiling and giggling. But you can't hear him, but like, that's a big deal. <laughs> right. And so, yes, you have to play to your strengths, but at the same time, you have to find out like, where are those things that are actually hurting the company as well or hurting your business as well? But there's nothing wrong with doing the thing that you do well and like making that the thing you do. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. And I think understanding your market is what drives that. So if you understand exactly what you do really, really well, and the market can support you as a coach making a living, just servicing that market, then go after that. Yeah. And then if it's not quite large enough, then you kind of back up just a little bit. Yep. But you don't have to try to offer everything. You just try to identify what's the right lane and how wide should that lane be that meets my personal goals. Yeah, like good. if you're not trying to make a ton of money and you just want to serve a certain type of population, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Serve that population and find the joy in that, make a little money doing it, and then just kind of adjust what you're offering and what you're focusing on based on what you're hoping to get out of your coaching or you're running your business and how much the market is available to support that. Yeah, that's good. Microgains continues to offer you solutions to add weight to your barbell, dumbbells, and weightlifting machines in small increments. No more 10 pound jumps. You know Microgains offers fractional plates for dumbbells and barbells. They also offer loadable dumbbell handles, five and 10 pound Olympic plates, micro plates in pounds or kilograms and a deadlift jack. They also now offer a gym pin to micro load your lat pull down or other machine exercises. Pretty cool. Go to microgains.com to get the equipment you need to get more PRs. That's microgains with a Z. Use code logic at checkout to get 10% off. That's microgains.com. Your press will thank you.
Josh, have you ever worked with companies who didn't really seem to have their purpose well-defined? And so it was like hard to kind of pinpoint what to market? Oh, Nikki, yes, almost. (laughs) (laughs) So I've worked with a lot of smaller businesses and a lot of like even nonprofits, a lot of churches and asking some of those folks like, who's your ideal client? It's like, oh, everybody, everybody's my ideal client. Yeah, it can be hard. It's not natural for some people, especially folks that are, you know, certain trade, like their emphasis is trade. They're great at their trade, but they're not great at sales. They're not great at thinking marketing and communication and product or service positioning. So that's not a natural thing for them. And so if that's you, talk to somebody, like find a small business that does websites, that does communication strategy, and it's okay to pay for that stuff. Like it's going to help you craft your message if you're not naturally good at that. Or there's a great podcast called Business Made Simple with Donald Miller that is fantastic for small business owners that will give you an education in marketing and communications with no cost at all. And so, yeah, I think it's the majority of people that I've talked to (laughs) struggle with that. You know, mentioning churches is interesting because like churches have to struggle with honing in on their demographic because they're like church. And again, whether you're listening to this and you're religious or not, like you understand the concept, right? Like if you're religious, this is like the most important thing in the whole world to you. And she's like, well, who's your target demographic? You're like, what? The whole world? Right. Yeah. Every soul who needs saving. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's right. the point, right? <laughs> Jesus kind of told me that that's, a, yeah. that's the whole, yeah. <laughs> and yet it comes down to that thing. And then you watch churches compete for people, which is gross. Yeah. yeah. We go to a church. I won't brag on my church. So we go to a church that we rent out their building on Sunday. They're a Saturday night church that specifically hones in on people who are in recovery from drug and alcohol abuse. And they're awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's their demographic. And what's interesting is, is that after someone has gone to that church, by the way, why do they do it on Saturday night and not Sunday morning? So that they don't go out to the bars. (laughs) Doesn't that make perfect logical sense, right? Anyway, so, and when they've gone through recovery, really enough to be like, then they actually want them to leave that church and go to a church that focuses more on, like, you're not in recovery anymore. You've been recovered for four years. You've been recovered for five years. And so, you know, that's a perfect example that can be easily translated into, into business. And so, and yet there's still a reason to like, how much is there a need to reach at churches levels, like all sorts of demographics, like just the way business does. Right. And so, yeah. And the way I would frame that question to like church leaders or pastors with those types of clients is what type of guest yeah. gets you most excited when you walk into the door versus just like, if it's a church that's well-equipped to serve families or well-equipped to serve seniors or whatever, That's the answer. And so it's like, this is the person that's going to feel most at home here. How do you make your website reflective of who you actually are? And it doesn't mean that you turn away people who are not part of that demographic. Same thing for us. Like, we know who our primary demographic is at Barbell Logic, but we've coached every demographic. We turn nobody down, but like, we know who we're marketing towards. And there are certain types of people that are going to last longer because it's a better fit for them. Yeah. And when you talk about Castnet Wide Net, even for us, as big of a company as we are, we focused a lot over the last year and, and continue to focus on what we've called the one degree of separation. So when you talked about like when you hone in on that niche, especially if you're coaching in person in not a huge city and you're like, man, my niche is this and I can only get seven clients and seven clients is not enough. Then rather than casting this massive net, you go, okay, here's the niche. What's one degree of separation from that niche? And now you can go from six clients to 18 clients, right? Because you don't need to go to 8,000. You can't sustain 8,000 clients, right? Even for us, it's the same thing. And so we didn't really have a niche that we targeted in the beginning. The company's been around for six years now. Like the niche is like, we've got the stats. We can kind of see who our middle of the bell curve demographic is. And we go, okay, that's who it is. Now, how do we start to branch out not to go two standard deviations or three standard deviations away from the middle of that bell curve, but one degree of separation away. And that's, I think, the best way to get the ball rolling. So that's good. So I totally poke fun at Matt sometimes about this, but Matt is such an amazing salesperson. So good. Great storyteller. He will tell the same story a thousand times and make it a little different each time. (laughs) And I believe every version. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) I believe them all. And like pulls you in and you re you keep crafting a really wonderful message about what Barbell Logic is. And you're okay to talk about your journey through strength and nutrition. And it's amazing. You really appeal to people. And then when I was wanting to grow more at Barbell Logic, I was like, do not make me do sales. I cannot do them. I am terrible at them. Like to this day, like I don't want to promote myself. 
I love this company. I believe in everything, but I don't want to do sales. <laughs> Terrible at it. So with marketing, I think, Josh, you mentioned this too, like you don't like self-promotion either. How do you, if you're that kind of person, craft a good marketing kind of strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's not an easy thing because there's a certain element of sales and even like people that pull, you know, uh, job descriptions based on sales. There are certain personality types that fit really well for that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're a small business or you're a coach, you may or may not have that personality type that's naturally like going to go out and sell what you do. But I think what it boils down to is the confidence in what you're doing and why you're doing it. So if you're a coach and you know that you know what you're doing, you're confident in your ability and your knowledge, the service that you're offering, right? And then you can fully understand the impact of what you're offering those folks. Like if you really believe that what you're doing, the service you're providing them is impacting their day-to-day -day lives. It's helping them stay accountable. It's helping them build a longer, healthier life. It's helping them model great habits for their children, whatever those things are. If you believe really that's what you're doing and that's the impact that your service is having, that's what you're selling. You're really not selling yourself. I mean, you are, but at the end of the day, that's the impact. That's the benefit to the user. And that's what you have to be talking about. So you have to get to this point where you push through the uncomfortable of, yes, I'm the face. I'm the face of this outcome for that user, for that client. And then being able just to, you know, get some consistency around the things we talked about before, like the communication things. And just like, you know, maybe it's setting a calendar that for the next three months, once a week, I'm going to share a story of a client or once a week, I'm going to share what coaching means to me on your personal social media channel. And you'll probably see somebody, you know, send a DM or a message on Facebook or whatever that says, hey, where would I get started? Or, you know, it might naturally generate some influence without you really saying, hey, I offer three coaching packages. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're opening the door to be trusted and to have a place in that person's brain of that's a person that could help me achieve my strength and fitness goals. And for people who are wired like me, who are wired for sales, the danger is, is that you can very quickly fall into the cult of personality of selling yourself. Man, that's a very narrow margin to try to sell on. Like when you sell you and something happens to you, your family starves, right? And so it works both ways, whether you're the personality who really struggles to sell if you sell the value of what you can provide other people, you're selling like that. I believe so much in this service. That's why it's so hard, Josh. I think you were saying before the call, we were kind of prepping a little bit. You're like, man, to try to sell whatever hash browns or to try to sell, I don't know how people sell cigarettes or something like that. Like, oh God, like how hard would it be to be marketing there? You know, mm -hmm. it's just, but when you really believe in what you sell, then if you're not great at selling, then you're not really selling you. You're selling this thing that will change people's lives for the better. And if you are great at selling, it will help pull you out of the narcissistic, egocentric selling me. And instead, you sell also the service that I really believe in. There are times when people have to have come to Jesus meeting like what you really believe in is you like that's a dangerous place to be. You know, listen, if I'm honest, like I would have loved to have been that guy. Ninety nine, two thousand one, two thousand five. Like that was like, I wanted to be like, I want to be in the team picture of the greatest strength coaches who ever lived, Matt Reynolds. And then you get to the point, you're like, Matt Reynolds can't change enough people's lives doing this. Like, what are we doing? You know, and like, and then you get on the rat race and you're like, you have to top yourself constantly. And so it's dangerous to be on either side. But if you really believe in what you provide, then that's what you sell. You sell the service, you sell the product that you believe in. So Josh, how have you taken this now? I want to spend a few minutes before the end of the show I think it's really cool. So you get to do, a lot of people probably have never heard of a CIO, a chief information officer is like this crazy combination of, you're like the head technology guy, like IT, it kind of encompasses IT, CTO, marketing, you're like all technology, everything at Barbell Logic, you're kind of like the top executive for all of those things. And so you're in the middle of this sort of fast growing tech slash service company but you've also been able to really scratch this itch with your nonprofit. Can you tell us a little bit about your nonprofit business? Yeah. So we talked about earlier, my marketing agency, one of my clients was a client called Go Shout Love, and it was a apparel t-shirt company, but it was a cause-driven t-shirt company. And so the model is families with kids on a rare medical journey. The company would feature a kiddo, 
design a t-shirt inspired by that child, sell it all month long, and then make a big donation to that family from those sales. And so in about 2014, I got connected with them and we built their website. We were also doing their storytelling. So we'd go and interview their families and put together their videos. And that would be what would really be released on social media and drive sales. About two years into that, the owner had some just some life changes kind of going on and they decided they need to take a break, which I was bummed about because I was losing a client. But more so, I had just really fallen in love with the mission that, you know, at the time I was just transitioned to being full time on my own in the agency. But before that, I had worked in another digital agency that, like you mentioned, selling hash browns, like I was managing some social media for a national brand doing, you know box mashed potatoes and hash browns. And there's just not much uh, fulfillment when you put your head on your pillow at night on uh, how many hash browns did we move off the shelf. But I was bummed because not only did I lose a client, but I just really believed in this work. I saw the tangible impact that this was making for families. And so I stayed in contact with the owner. And after about two years, they kind of said, it doesn't look like we're going to come back. But you know, if you think you could run with it, you know, we'll talk about that. And so we worked that out. And basically my wife and I acquired their social media assets, their past designs, and their purchase history. So we had an email list and relaunched the brand after about two years of nothing going on with the brand on social media, relaunched it in July of 2018. And so we've been doing that since then. And then we transitioned it from a business, a for-profit business to a nonprofit January 1 of this year. So oh, nice. yeah, it's been an interesting journey, but um, it's been a lot of fun. What's the Instagram handle for it? Go Shout Love, at Go Shout Love. That's what I thought. Yep prepare yourself for tearjerkers. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of happy cries. It's a lot of happy cries and some sad ones too. Yeah. I'm thankful for what you're doing there. It's been a really cool to watch the growth of that and to watch the support that's rolled in for those kiddos. It's really cool. So yeah. Feature these kiddos who are often terminal. Yeah. A lot of times we've sadly in the last year, three kiddos that we featured have, mm -hmm. have passed yeah. and it's hard. I mean, it's raw sure. that these families are going through, but What's cool, you know, when we got started with this, I thought like this thing that we're doing is raising funds for these families. And the biggest like shift in my perspective is that really the, the dollars are secondary. This is a whole like group of people in our society that oftentimes feel overlooked. Their stories aren't heard. And so we put together a video for them that's used on social media. We do a podcast interview and tell their story and it's their voice being heard and people like rallying around them, messages of support, their social media, their individual social media accounts grow sure. because we kind of shine a light on them. People can stay connected with those families and kind of keep supporting them through hospital stays and all these other things. And so it really gives a voice to a certain portion of our society that unfortunately is often overlooked. While, you know, we've been able to raise over $330,000 for 66 families through this last month, that's great. But really these stories is what matters to them. Yeah, I would think connecting them to a community, of, especially with the parents of other parents who can just sympathize. Yeah. Like that's one of the hardest things when you see somebody going through struggle or tragedy and you don't know what to say if you haven't gone through the thing, right? Like you just want to say like, I love you. I'm sorry. I want to be here for you any way I can. But the last thing you want to say is like, I know how you feel because you don't. And so I would think it would have to be helpful to just connect them with a community of people who do know what it's like to go through this thing. Yeah. And it's not a big community, but that's one of the few good powers of the internet, right? Is that we can connect. Yes, that's exactly right. Social media can be a brutal place, but in this case, every family we talked to just interviewed a family yesterday that Pitt Hopkins is the diagnosis and that's a pretty rare diagnosis, but there's a whole online community of people that can like, and oftentimes these families are more equipped for their medical conversations with their doctor and they're teaching the doctors things. Right. Because of how rare it is. Yeah, exactly. And it's a really positive thing uh, that it is a positive of social media that these groups can connect in the way they do. That's awesome. So at Go Shout Love, Instagram is your primary place that you feature that, right? And then I know a bunch of our staff members have even gone on and bought t-shirts and sweatshirts and stuff. These are great designs. It goes to a good cause. And so um, Go Shout Love is a wonderful organization. I'm glad you're able to do that. And I hope it allows you to scratch the itch while you're in the middle of uh, this ridiculous high stress job of, you know, that's going through all this crazy growth and that you get to do this thing, you know, on a weekly basis to go back and go like, I can take a breath and <laughs> it's hopefully not quite as crazy. No, it's good. I enjoy it. You know, I have a great team of people. We're small. We run very lean, but the people that we have believe in what we're doing, they're passionate about it. It's a lot of fun. I was thinking uh, before this call, a few minutes before this call, as we wrap this up, when did you start working for us full-time? 
When was the ballpark month and year? Uh, it feels about 30 <laughs> years ago. I know, right? <laughs> I think it was like April of 2020. So okay. a year and a half, okay. maybe. I can remember sitting out on the back deck, having a conversation with you. And I'd already talked to Nikki and Andrew. And I was like, I'm going to offer Josh a full-time position. So you had been working with me and with my companies in the past for years and years out of your own business, out of your own. So as a right. contractor, essentially for us, contracting work. And I was like, man, I'm just ready to, <laughs> I just need, we need Josh all the time. And funniest question Josh has ever asked me was, do you think there's actually enough work for me to take a full-time job with you guys? Or do you think this is just a season of busy and then it will just die down and you're going to be like, man, I don't know that we have enough to keep you busy now. And that was Josh's concern was that two months <laughs> later, you could see Josh's face right we now. were going to let him go. <laughs> and, uh, and a year and a half later of 70 hour work weeks, um, <laughs> we doing okay on oh, keeping you busy. I think, uh, you delivered on the promise of <laughs> not having a shortage of work. <laughs> well, you know, for me, it was that stage. Cause like, you know, for entrepreneurs, one of the main things is like not working for the yeah. man. Right. Yeah. I was like, Oh, cause originally I first conversation we had, I said, well, you know, what if we like just did a retainer and like set up this, you know, more of a fixed relationship from a client side approach. And uh, that was kind of where I was leaning. And then a week later or so, Matt was like, no, I think we let, let think about this again. And I was like, you know, that's really what it was for me. It's like, sure. I didn't want to like, like walk away from taking new clients. I still take care of some of my old clients, but like, sure. I didn't want to walk away from that. And then be like six months in be like, well, that was great. You know, it's like, now we need to scale back, <laughs> you know? Right. So <laughs> that hasn't happened. No, so far that has not happened. A few promotions later, you're part of mission control. You're a major decision maker. You're a partner in the company at this point now, man, we're super thankful to have you. It's been uh <laughs> freaking awesome how beautiful is the website like come on it's amazing. oh you guys are, I, <laughs> we your team you page the rest of the nest and the rest of the team they just you make us look 10x more professional than we actually are mm -hmm. and that's great <laughs> that's what we want <laughs> and so that uh, i mean i'm just i'm always so impressed at the professionalism that you guys are able to put out and quickly right like and I think part of that is the consistent voice. You've done such a good job of having that one consistent voice. Like, you know, the design elements, you know, the fonts, you know, the things. And the more we've been able to work together, it's like, if I had to go hire a new design team, graphic designer, get on Upwork.com or something, I hired, like every time I had to re-explain all this stuff. And it's so easy to be able to go. And then just, it turns out quickly. And you're like, oh my God, this is incredible. How You know what actually spurned this? So I don't think I've ever told you guys a story. I was on the two weeks before I offered you that original full-time job, Josh, I was on an airplane. And someone was riding in front of me and I was on the aisle on the left side. And the person who was on the aisle on the right side and one row in front of me was working on their computer and they were working on something. And I could just see how well the design was of the thing they were working on. I didn't know what company it was for. It was for some sort of presentation. It was like a presentation piece. And I was just like, God, it's so beautiful. And it's so well put together. And it just looks like something I want to stare at instead of most like PowerPoint presentations where you're like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I thought, how do we get that here? And that's how we did it. And that's such a tiny little piece of what you do for us. It's like, there's so much more, but I remember thinking to myself, I've got to, and then I thought, Hey, that guy that used to come over to my basement during the tornadoes, he's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you have been. So then I get a call. Hey, Josh, can you be a professional PowerPoint maker for us? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and so that's pretty much all I've done. That's right. That's basically The it. block party presentations were just beautiful. You set us up for success. They yeah. were incredible. <laughs> that's right. But it's been cool too, because it's been interesting. We've got a couple guys like you or staff members like you who didn't start as lifters. And now you're, it's been awesome to watch. You're going through the journey of LP and lifting weights and like learning how, you know, what that voluntary hardship feels like with the barbell on your back. Yeah. And I'm currently dying three times a week is what I told my <laughs> wife last night. It's, uh, you yeah. seem beefier in your shoulders and traps. I can totally tell For the sure. difference. Oh, thank you. More broad. Thank you. Last night, my wife said, I don't think you're quite as fat as you were. <laughs> that's a start. And, and no, she didn't put it that way. She said, you actually, you look more toned. And I was like, well, well that's, that's good. Go. I'm not doing it for nothing. So yeah. There we go. Go shout toned. <laughs> <laughs> go shout toned. Yeah. It's been challenging because it is so outside of my normal. Yeah. It's outside of my comfort zone because I like I played, you know, basketball and golf in high school. But when I was in high school, like I could eat anything and not gain. I was like sickly looking. I was so skinny. Right. And so I just have always kind of had this like, I'm just always going to be like not able to build strength. And so this has really challenged me to get after it a little bit and to push myself and and learn to grind when things get a little bit more difficult, which I'm good at in other areas of life, yeah. but physically until I 
started with a coach, like for about nine months or so, I was doing some in the garage. Yeah. And some was like, it felt good because I was getting comfortable under the bar a little bit. But like, so when I got started with a coach, I was like, yeah, I've done a little bit of work. And then it was like, I have been cheating <laughs> for nine yeah. months. Yeah. And I'm about six weeks in, I guess now. Yeah. It's, you know, Brett McKay talked about infusing discipline with joy. And I'm not sure I'm fully there yet. I'm still trying to find You're like that place. like 90 discipline, 10 joy right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do feel like with like each workout and each week, it's shifting a little bit where it's like, I don't, I'm not dreading it. I'm like looking forward to like being able to push that mark complete yeah. and upload my videos and like, yeah, I hit them. And so, yeah, it's been interesting. Well, and how valuable is it to have you at where you're at as an executive in the company to be able to then also like really sympathize with what it, feels like to be a client because you are a client. As a matter of fact, right. we're all clients. Right. That's right. Another story for another day. I hired Jillian. Jillian's my first strength coach I've had in 15 years. Yeah. I have not wanted a strength coach. I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. And Jillian's been coaching me. I'm so yeah. sore right now. <laughs> so, I'm dying. So now internally in the company communications, uh, there are two mats now. <laughs> oh, uh, there's Matt and Fat Matt. And he refers to... Uh, Pulling off images that have fat mat. Yeah. It makes me so frustrated now because I've lost 60 pounds and I keep seeing these marketing pictures mm -hmm. that were just from not that long mm -hmm. ago, from three or four months ago when I was 40 pounds heavier. I'm like, can we not use those pictures? <laughs> like Nikki already looked good. Andrew already looked good. Use pictures of them. Don't use pictures of fat mat. Like let's get, let's wait till we get some pictures of skinny mat and we can do that. But no, it's been good. It's interesting with you and your lifting is that you had all the education before you ever started, which is so interesting, right? So we got to get our videographer, Sam, we're calling you out. Sam's got the same way. Like Sam oh knows God. everything yeah. there is to know about lifting, having never lifted now because he's done every <laughs> video we've ever done at Barbell Logic. And Josh was the same way. He had all this education. So he knows. I wonder sometimes if it's maybe, maybe a little easier is probably not the right word, but like you knew what to expect, like when it gets really hard or it's August and it's hot in the garage, you know, like, I really don't want to do this, but you kind of already understood because you have been educated for so many years about the value of what you were doing. It's got to be hard for people that are starting this and don't have the education. And it's August 15th and it's 98 in the garage. And they're like, screw this, I'm out. Do you think it helps some or it's still just hard? Yeah, it helps some, but there's still a difference between like knowing it and feeling it. Yes. Oh, for mm -hmm. sure. And if you've never tried it, then you don't feel it. But I think for me, hands down, the most value is the accountability. Yes. Like for example, yesterday I had a super long day of work and then I had to pick up both kids and then it was meet the teacher night. So my wife's a teacher. So she didn't get to come home. Uh -huh. She had her own thing going on and I had to take both kids. My oldest starts kindergarten. So we did all that, get home, get them both to bed. I did not want to train and it was my day to train. Oh man. Yeah. And if it were before I had started with a coach, it would have been like, I'm just not going to do it tonight or I'm going to do 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And I did it and it was super hot. Yep. And I feel a lot better because I yeah. checked the box. Right. I uploaded my videos and I marked it yeah. complete. And I've already had my feedback and there's tons of opportunity for improvement. I've had a really difficult time learning to set my back on the deadlift. I feel like my back is set, but Skill and still working with me on that. Apparently, I haven't twerked enough in my life to have that. Got the body uh, awareness of a junior high boy. I noticed your absence on the dance floor at the blog party. I was there. Were you I twerking? Yeah, they started. They started it. I, oh, no. The twerk, the, yes. The, the twerking was absent. I was dancing. Yes. But yeah, so it's been interesting. I'm learning a lot, but it is building for me. I don't really, I may be in the minority here. I don't really care about PRs. I don't mm -hmm. really care about the leaderboard. Sure. I want to feel good. I want to look as good as I can so that my wife doesn't leave me. And I want your wife is super cute. So I get it. <laughs> I, I love her. I want my kids to make health a priority yeah. and see me making health a priority and see me doing hard things and yeah. be inspired to do that in their own life and make that part of their life ongoing. Because, you know, I have diabetes in my family. My dad hasn't managed that well. He's a great, I mean, I love him. He's perfect dad. He is not taking care of himself. Yeah. And if I, go through life and as busy as he was owning a business, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to end up in that shape. And I don't want that. Yeah. I want to be around a long time for my kids, for my grandkids. And uh, so for me, that's... By the way, that's not the minority. You're not in the minority. That's the big message we're trying to put. You're in the majority. And for people who are chasing PRs, and that's number one, like that's great too. Yes, 
we'll meet you where you are and we'll help you chase PRs. Those are super, super fun. But the majority of people who come to Barbell Logic are just like you. They're like, man, getting strong is fun. Getting strong is cool. Adding some muscle is cool. But what I really want to do is like be really healthy and like be there for my kids and, you know, like walk my granddaughters down the aisle at their way, like yep. that kind of stuff. Like that's, that's what matters. That's what matters to me yep. now, right? Like I've done the strength at all costs. I've put the thousand pounds on my back and run down the street with it on a yoke. Like I have no desire to ever do that again. That's why I said huge neighbor when you asked at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, in fact, that's actually how he knew like, what I did. that guy's really good at bringing in a lot of groceries. I need yeah. that right, guy. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Could you put that rock on my lawnmower and mow my lawn while you're out there? <laughs> it was, you know, we used to go out and flip tires down the street. And he's like, what is, what are those guys doing out there? So it's, we didn't have an HOA. It's crazy. That, that one. It was it, pretty much. No, right. As a matter of fact, in fact, it's why I bought a house with an HOA from that neighborhood. So the neighborhood got shady yeah. over the years. So, dude, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a great you. conversation. We've talked about you a couple of times on the podcast. It's been great to actually introduce you yeah. on the podcast and have you on and talk through. We're so thankful for what you do for the company and thankful for what you do for Go Shout Love and the families there. And Man, it's just been a blessing to have you as part of the team and part of the leadership team as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. And if you guys are wondering what Josh looks like, he looks like Doug from the cartoon, <laughs> but more jacked. He's jacked. Oh, <laughs> I've never had that. I've had a few. Have anyone ever told you you look like this? Never Doug. That's a new one for me. So, okay. Good to know. <laughs> But more jacked, okay. way more. Well, jacked. I would hope so Unless because that up. character is like <laughs> as thin as Boswell, real yeah. thin, except for his head, it's like olive oil. But a guy, <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> really <laughs> setting the bar there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is a, another edition of the business series for the Barbell Logic Podcast. Coming at you with lots of small business. We're trying to do this, try to meet you guys where you are. For those of you that are interested in business and growing business, whether it's coaching or something else, you know, and not approach it from this like big business side, but from a small business personality, meet people where you are. And so I hope this brought you some value. If it did, we'd love a five-star review. Go follow Go Shout Love, buy a t-shirt, buy a sweatshirt. They have all kinds of cool stuff out there and support Josh and uh, what he's trying to do. And so when you think that the things that Barbell Logic puts out look really nice and look really cool, thank Josh, because yes, I certainly, <laughs> I don't have a creative bone in my body. And Paige and Ness. Yeah, of course. The Your whole team, so the, the whole design team is outstanding. So yeah. thank you all for the work that you do. So that's been another edition of the Barbell Logic Podcast, and we'll see you in the next couple of days.